Welcome back. This is the House Education Committee and on Wednesday, February 17th. And we are going to be hearing a little bit about the court action that's happened related to public dollars being used for religious schools. There are a couple of court cases that our um, lead counsel, Jim Desmarais, has been working on. And I'd like to, I'd like to welcome Jim back. And we will be followed by um, Peter Teachout, professor at Vermont Law School, who has some possible responses. Thank you. Welcome back, Jim. Great. Sure. Nice to be here. Um, so just as a um, statement at the beginning, the uh, expert here is Peter Teachout. Professor Teachout has an expert in this topic. I am a JV player at best. <laughs> I'm going to uh, go through some slides just to get the context for you. And then Professor Teachout will give you, I believe, some proposed solutions. And I will say that at the outset, the problem set to be solved here is we've got a situation in Vermont where we've got court orders that if they're complied with, they will violate the Vermont Constitution. If they're not complied with, they will violate the U.S. Constitution. So we're at kind of in the crosshairs uh, of an impossible situation. And that's what we're trying to find our way through. Um, so I'll just say that at the beginning. Let me give you the context, I think, First T-shirt will do an excellent job in talk, talking about that, that tension right there. So let me share my screen. Um, and my slides are here. Okay. Okay. Can everybody see this? Looks kind of small to me. I'm assuming you can see this, yes? Can see it? Uh, does it need to be just a little bit bigger? Like that? Yeah. Okay. How's that? Yeah. Great. Okay. All right. Okay. So for the record, uh, Jim Damory, let's console. Uh, we're going. To, we're going through this slide deck um, about the use of public tuition for re religious schools, and also a side topic, kind of a subset of that topic, is on dual enrollment. Um, let's start by looking at the U.S. Constitution where it says um, the First Amendment has two religion clauses. The first is that Congress should make no law respecting an establishment of religion. That's known as the Establishment Clause. And the second is that Congress should make no law prohibiting the free exercise of religion. So it's called the free exercise clause. So if you think about the first one, uh, establishment clause, and go back to the founding of the country of the nation, um, the intent around that broadly is we're not going to create the Anglican Church as a state-sponsored church uh, in the U United States. So it goes to uh, laws that um, would establish. Um, a religion or even laws to go to support a religion come up in this context. And free exercise, of course, goes to the uh, right of individuals to exercise their religious beliefs, beliefs without interference. Um, so these, these constitutional provisions apply to each, each of the states. Um, so it applies not just to the federal government, to the state governments. And there's a tension between these two provisions. Uh, the Supreme Court has recognized a play in the joints between what the Establishment Clause permits and the Free Exercise Clause compels. So um, on the one hand, you have a command uh, not to establish a religion. And on the other hand, a command not to inhibit it practice. So for example, a law requiring the hiring by the military of priests to minister to, to the troops may be viewed as a law respecting the establishment of religion because you have a state or a federal government hiring priests. So that looks like you're establishing a religion, but not making priests available may interfere with the troops free exercise of religion. 
So that's the kind of tension we're talking about here. And what we're talking about mainly is the free exercise clause because the establishment clause um, issues have pretty much gone away. And I'll just spend a minute talking about the establishment clause before we go on to the free exercise clause. So the question is, what does the establishment clause permit? So how much state support can, can be given to a protocol school without violating the establishment clause? And there's a court case in 2002 so it's really the, um, the modern view. Uh, before that case, there was a lot of litigation around, around this question. Um, and uh, the court consider, considered that supporting a religious school um, could violate the establishment clause because if you're giving money to a public school or a parochial school, uh, they could then uh, use that funding uh, and divert other funds for religious practice. So there's a lot of case law about that years ago and lots of case law about diversion arguments. That no longer applies. So today's, today's law, as established in this case, is essentially that, that if a um, government aid program is neutral with respect to religion, so let's take this case here, we had a voucher program that um, allowed public taxpayer money to be used to support both secular and parochial schools. So it was neutral because it didn't just say one or the other. So if it's neutral uh, and decide, uh, provides assistance to a broad class of citizens who in turn direct the aid um, as a result of their own independent private choice. So the parents get to choose where to spend the money, then it's not going to be subject to, very, to challenge under the establishment clause. Um, so therefore, what this is saying is that if you have a neutrally designed program uh, designed to benefit both private and public school, so both um, parochial and secular schools, um, and parents make the choice, you don't have a problem with the establishment clause, essentially. So we're gonna move off the establishment clause because it's not gonna be an issue, but it has been an issue in the past and for context, just so that you know it was there at one point as, as an issue. I see a raised hand, do you want me to stop and, and take questions? Uh, yeah, sure, Representative Austin. Yep, just real quickly, how are religions defined? I mean, could anybody just start a religion and get money or vouchers? Uh, well, I, I, I can't answer that question broadly, Rep. Austin. What I will say is that in Vermont, in order to receive public funding, um, an independent school, which is what we're talking about here, has to be approved by the Agency of Education. There has to meet certain requirements by the agency to be approved. Only approved schools can receive public funding. So in Vermont, at least, it wouldn't be any religious, religious school. It would be only those which are approved by the agency uh, to receive public funding. And th th those requirements include a number of ones around teaching and, and requirements there to have at least a minimal standard uh, uh, that would justify using public funds. Thank you. Hmm. Great. Okay. So the real question of this deck is what does the free exercise clause compel? And you'll, well, what I mean by compel will be made obvious by this case here. It's so called, the so called playground case. It's called Trinity Lutheran versus Comer, decided back in 19, 2017. And this was a grant program uh, created by Missouri. And the program gave funding to resurface playgrounds. Um, so it's really for, for safety, for health and safety of kids. Um, and, um, and that funding was made available um, to uh, various programs that have playgrounds. Uh, and a church, which operated a daycare program 
uh, was denied that funding because it's a church. It's, it was owned by a church. So because of its staffs as a church, Missouri said, no, we can't give you this, this funding. Um, and that now was based in the Missouri Constitution, which has a so-called no, no, aid, aid, no aid clause, which I'll come on to in a minute. But what that Constitution said was, no money shall, shall ever be taken from the public treasury directly or indirectly in aid of any church. So um, Missouri respected that provision in its constitution and, and denied funding for uh, resurfacing this playground owned by a church. But the Supreme Court disagreed and said that that now violated the church's free exercise rights. What it says is that the free exercise clause protects religious observers against unequal treatment and it subjects to the strictest scrutiny laws that target religion for special disabilities based on their status. So applying that principle, the court held that denying a generally available benefit solely on account of religious identity imposes a penalty on the free exercise of religion and can be justified only by a state interest of the highest order. And pause there. What this is saying is that if you make a benefit available generally, um, you can't deny that benefit to a church or, or a parochial school solely on the account of, of the fact that it's um, religious. Okay, that's, that's what this is saying. Uh, and in making that decision, the court talked about this other case called Locke. And to summarize what Locke said was, um, in that case, there's a program um, to provide scholarship funding um, that could be used at a post-secondary school, but um, uh, it could be used both at, at secular and religious schools, but couldn't be used to pursue a devotional theology degree. It could, could not be used for purposes of uh, promoting religion, basically. So it wasn't, it wasn't a case of, of, um, of not providing funding based upon Stas, it was based on the use of the funding, saying, um, saying that this case basically holds that while you can tie funding, public funding, uh, while you can um, require that that funding be, be used in certain ways, or not used in this case for religious worship or to promote uh, theology. Uh, you can do that, but you can't discriminate based upon the status of the, of the institution. So now that we're coming to a use versus status distinction here, which is very important. So um, you, can't discriminate based on, you cannot discriminate based on status, but you can conditional, condition public funding to a parochial school based upon its use of that funding. Um, and we're going to go on to talk about um, uh, the, the Espinosa case, but um, in this case here, in the Trinity case, Gorsuch had this concurring opinion, which basically questions that line between use and status. And I'll just read this because it's kind of interesting anyway. It says, the court leaves open the possibility a useful distinction might be drawn between laws that discriminate on the basis of religious status and religious use. Respectfully, I harbor doubts about the stability of such a line. Does a religious man say grace before dinner, or does a man begin his meal in a religious manner? The distinction blurs in much the same way the line between acts and omissions can blur and assert act too long, leaving us to ask, for example, whether the man who drowns by awaiting the incoming tide does so by act, coming upon the sea or omission, allowing the sea to come upon him. 
often the same facts can be described both ways. So Gorsuch is questioning this distinction between use and status. But the court is holding that you can't discriminate based on status, you can discriminate, discriminate based upon the use of the funding. Um, so next case is the Espinoza case. And in this case, Montana provided tax benefits to individuals um, who donated money for private school scholarships but prohibited families from using the scholarships at parochial schools. And this again was based in the Montana Constitution, which bars government aid to any school controlled by any church. Again, a, no, a so called no aid provision. So, based upon its um, Trinity decision, the court held in this case that the uh, no aid provision violates the Fair Exercise Clause because it bars religious schools from public benefit solely because of the religious character of its school. So based on status. So that basically carried the reasoning of Trinity, which was, was, was about funding for playground resurfacing to use of public tuition at um, parochial schools. Again, the course holding it can't discriminate based upon status. Um, also what's interesting about this is the court spent quite a bit of time talking about the background of these no aid provisions in state constitutions. So there was a proposed uh, amendment to the US Constitution by Blaine, who was a congressman, um, and that failed. Um, but that, that provision was adopted by a number of state constitutions in the 19th century. And it was a provision born of bigotry against Catholics. So the idea of not giving aid to the schools was designed, at least in part, to prevent funding going to Catholic schools. Uh, and the court you know that that's hardly hardly advances of tradition to be informed uh, to inform them in interpreting the free exercise clause. The court concluded that a state needs not subsidize private education. But once the state decides to do so, it cannot disqualify some private schools solely because they are religious. Okay. okay. So what we know so far is that at the U.S. Supreme Court level, you can't discriminate uh, against a school based upon its status as a, as a parochial school, um, but you can restrict the use of funding by a parochial school so that it does not go to being used for religious instruction or worship. Uh, that's what the Supreme Court is as of today. The Mall Constitution has uh, the Compelled Support Clause, which says no person can be compelled to support any place of worship contrary to the dictates of conscience. So a couple of things. Um, First of all, this is different from the no aid state constitutional provisions. Um, our provision is based upon the use of funds. So we can't use funds to support a place of worship. It does not, not prohibit based upon status. So Vermont's constitution in this respect is in line with where the US Supreme Court is today. Um, and note that this provision in the Vermont Constitution was uh, part of its original constitution, it was not part of the uh, land amendments that happened in the um, uh, 19th century. So the leading case we have interpreting uh, the Vermont Constitution is Chittenden Town versus Department of Education from 1999. And in this case, the Vermont Supreme Court held the school district violates the compelled support clause when it pays public tuition to a religious school in the absence of adequate safeguards against the use of such funds for religious worship or instruction. So again, going to use. I just ask a, a question um, that I just got stuck on. So, um, so you went back and you said, um, 
in the, the, the compelled clause, no support any place of worship. Um, what about taxpayers? So are, ta will, are taxpayers compelled to support if? Yes. So this is saying this is saying you can't use taxpayer. So Chittenden, let's go to Chittenden for a second. Okay. The case you. itself. So Chittenden was a uh, school district near Brandon, where I live. Um, and the parents of a student in Chittenden, it's a tuition town, wanted to send their student to Mount St. Joseph in Rutland, a uh, Catholic school. And um, the Vermont Supreme Court said, okay, uh, Chittenden, you are allowed to pay tuition to Mount St. Joseph as long as there are adequate safeguards against the use of that funding for religious instruction. So, um, so yes, it is about taxpayers in this case, in terms of they're being compelled to support a religious institution through the taxpayer dollars. And this says that's okay if there are safeguards against the use of those funds for religious, religious purposes. Is that clear? Thank you. Yep, okay. So the question is, um, well, shouldn't then survive Espinoza? Um, the Vermont Supreme Court, the Vermont Compelled Support Clause uh, bars the use of public funds for religious worship or instruction. In contrast, the state constitutions that bar aid to churches based on status. But does that distinction matter? So Roberts, uh, in his opinions, are, is hedging on that, and Gorsuch is challenging that. So while today the Vermont Constitution is in line with Espinoza, uh, it's a question going forward whether that distinction will hold. Um, and whether eventually the court will just say it doesn't matter whether it's based on use or status, you can't discriminate based on either. But today, uh, that distinction does hold. And today, um, we are in line with uh, the interpretation of Espinoza. Um, and also, in terms of, uh, of Vermont's constitution, again, was not part of the anti Catholic uh, May Blame Amendment. So it's got a very different history. Than those ones did. Um, so dual enrollment is an offshoot of this question. And some of the cases that, that um, Professor Tisha will be talking about, I believe, are dual enrollment cases. And what's been happening, let me just frame this for a minute. What's been happening is that since um, Chittenden was decided over 20 years ago, there's been no guidance given to school districts as to what types of safeguards uh, could be put in place to ensure that public funds aren't used for religious instruction. So in the meantime, without guidance, school districts have been on their own to decide what's appropriate. And many of them have denied that funding. And the rationale they've been giving is we can't fund you, uh, Rice Academy, for example, because you're, you are a parochial school. So the record before these courts is that um, the school districts are denying funding based on status, even though that's not what Chittenden said, that's actually what's been happening in the state and that's causing problems and we're having issues in court because courts say, hey, you can't do that. Um, so, We'll get onto the solution, but um, a hit in that direction is doing something, to give districts more guidance as to how to comply with, with that Chittenden decision. But as far as the dual enrollment, which is a kind of, as I say, say a subset question, um, first of all, what is it? Dual enrollment is taking a class from both high school and college credit at the same time. And it's available to, to public school students, to approved independent school students on public tuition, and to homeschool students. It is not available, this is by statute, it's not available uh, to approved independent school students on private tuition. Uh, so whether you're attending Rice uh, High School, which is parochial, 
uh, on private tuition. But whether you're attending Burr Burton on private tuition, um, you can't use uh, dual enrollment because it's only available if you're on public tuition or if you're homeschooled um, or, or you attend public school. So if you're, um, from an, if you're in a non-op, if you, your town does not operate, yep. then you can uh, send your, your student to a uh, approved, public, approved school yep. and you would have access. If, if you would have access to dual enrollment. You but would. If, if you, sure, go ahead. Yep. But if you, your town operates a high school, for example, and you wanted um, to send your your uh, son or daughter to a private school, so you're doing it by choice, not as a public not on public school dollars. Then you would not have access to it. Yeah. So so that's true. Um, so if you're if you're on public tuition, um, you have access to it, um, and some operating schools can tuition students out on an exceptional basis. So it's unusual, but for example, if you are in Mulberry and your school, you go to um, the public uh, operating school there, but it doesn't have a program or two that you want for your child, you can, you can ask the um, school district to pay tuition for that student. So in some cases it's for operating schools, but usually it's for tuition districts. Um, okay, so we have the Rice case. Um, she had a group of Rice Memorial High, high School students to the Agency of Education claiming uh, free exercise clause violations, um, saying that the denial, the denial of dual enrollment to Rice students is due to their religious status um, of the school. Uh, and uh, there's a ruling on January 15 um, by the federal court and it ruled in favor of the students holding that the denial was due to the school's religious status. Um, the court noted that in the more than 20 years since Chittenden was decided, Vermont has not identified adequate safeguards to ensure public funds are not used for religious instruction. And moreover, the court noted that since at least 2010, uh, agency of education has frequently stated that public funds could not be used for students attending religious schools, a statement based on the school staffs rather than its use of funds. So the record doesn't look good because while we could have a um, separate system whereby there are safeguards in place to ensure that these funds were properly used, that wasn't done. And in the meantime, there have been denials that in the record say we're denying you based on your SAS. So based on that, the, the uh, courts have been holding that there's been a violation of the U.S. Constitution here. Um, and you have to provide dual enrollment to these students. Um, okay. Um, so the court also said that because its decision turns expressly on the status and not the use. Uh, we express no view in this opinion as to whether the Chittenden requirement of adequate safeguards could, if applied, constitute a use-based restriction that survives. So the court in the Rice case basically sidesteps with Chittenden, Chittenden is still good law because it didn't have to reach that question because on the record, these um, dual enrollment applications will be denied based on staffs and not on use. Um, and that's where I'm gonna leave it there. I'm happy to take questions. Um, and then I think Professor Tisha will give you some further guidance in this area. Representative Conlon. So the, the um, Rice case is kind of confusing. Uh, it's, a, it's a case about the access to the dual enrollment benefit. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Now, dual enrollment isn't open to any student that's not being supported by public school dollars. So uh, that one does not seem to be a situation of religious 
connection at all, unless the students at Rice are also arguing that they should be on public tuition dollars while attending Rice. So the, the issue in, um, I think, Rice was, that it is a bit of a different issue than the pure use of public tuition uh, for, private, for, for uh, public schools. That's true. But the issue in Rice, the issue with dual enrollment is, if you're on private tuition, whether you're at Rice or whether you're at Burberton, you don't get dual enrollment. So you can argue that it's not discrimination based upon religious status because it's not available to private students going to Burberton either. But the court record shows, I believe, in this case, that the denial of dual enrollment benefits for Rice students by the school district was because of its staffs as a religious school. So it was looking at the record before it, and that's what it, it, it made its judgment based on. So okay. I think it had a poor record basically in front of it. It had a poor record because again, in 20 years since Chittenden, we haven't done anything to give guidance to school districts as to how to provide safeguards. Right, but it would seem to me that that court record is basically in error in that if you're not being supported by public dollars, dual enrollment's not open to you regardless of what school you go to. Yeah, that, that is, I think, a valid argument, but that's not where the court went. Um, okay. and but but that, still, that still has to be heard, right? It, that, was, that was Second Circuit Court of Appeals, I believe. So that could be appealed further on to the Supreme Court. I'm not sure if it will be. Yeah, I, I totally struggle with that one as well. <laughs> um. It just seems like the, the court record is incorrect, that the reason that they were denied should have been that, that it's the same for anybody who's not being supported by public dollars. Yeah. So the, the next thing that, that the next step would be the US Supreme Court. I believe so, yeah. yeah. So uh, the recently we had one where a preliminary injunction was uh, provided by the second or whatever court we're in, Second Circuit Court of Appeals. That was a different case. That has to do more with tuition dollars going to religious schools, right? There have been a number of cases that I could get them confused, but I thought in the fall there was an, a preliminary injunction uh, in, in the Rice case uh, because it was likely on the merits that, that the students would win. And then in January of this year, they decided the students did win, I think. So I think oh, that was, okay. I think. Okay. Yeah, I didn't you know. It, it, it moved to the next step. All right. Thanks. Okay. So, response. Any other questions? Excuse me, Representative Brown. Thank you, Chair Webb. Um, Jim, I didn't know, do you know um, strategically, is the state considering seeking Supreme Court review on this or is that a decision that's still under consideration? It's really between the, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure actually, it is against the secretary, I think. I'm not sure where, where they're going with that. Thanks. Representative Coopley. Just asking, did we did we review a bill last year um, with students living on a Vermont border attending schools in New York State that were not eligible for dual enrollment? Is, is that? Yeah, there was something. Uh, yeah. I can't remember what that was. They were attending. Um, I think it was a bill that was introduced by uh, Rob uh, Robin Chestnut Tangerman. Right. Um, a new, uh, bordering Vermont town, attending school, a public school in New York State, are not eligible for dual enrollment, and I I could never wrap my hands around that very well. Um, I think they want. Didn't they want to use the dollars in New York? I think they wanted to. Yeah, I think so. I think, yeah, I think that could have been enough. that could have been it. Um, yeah. Just bringing that up. So other questions on, on the case. Um, 
sorry, I'm still struggling with the decision, <laughs> but that's too bad. Um, we, we have this, that the next up is nothing or the Supreme Court, that, that it just becomes something that we, we need to address. And uh, Professor Teachout, I think you had some, some thoughts on what we as a legislature might do in response to this to set some guardrails. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Peter Teachout. I teach constitutional law at Vermont Law School. I sometimes testify up in the legislature. I, one of my areas is both state constitutional law and federal constitutional law. I try to be helpful. Sometimes I think I'm a little helpful. Sometimes I just add complications. So I'm going to share a few thoughts with you today. I did submit some prepared written testimony. I am not going to read it. I would like to track it in my oral testimony. Before I do that, I wonder if I could respond to Representative Conlin's question about the dual enrollment program and the status of that litigation. I don't, I think it's not a problem of an inadequate or a false or a phony or misleading factual record before the court. The court did make specific findings. The problem is the legislation has one set of rules, but in practice, the court found, this is a factual find, in practice, both school districts and the agency of education were using the religious status of schools as a surrogate, just a simple, we're not going to allow you to participate because you are attending a religious school. That's what the court found. And because of that, the court said, we're, it really doesn't matter that much what the legislation itself says if the practice violates our prohibition against discrimination based solely on religious status, that's a violation of the free exercise clause. So I don't think it's likely that will be appealed to the Supreme Court or will be heard by the Supreme Court, it's possible. But I think probably that factual finding would be dispositive in any case. The practice violates the free exercise clause, not necessarily the law. So that can be corrected, but it needs to be corrected. Anyway, that we've got both dual enrollment up there and tuition re reimbursement program. And I would like to focus in my own testimony, if you are going to be willing to focus on the tuition reimbursement case, because there was a Second Circuit appellate court decision in January of this year in joining school districts in Vermont from continuing to refuse to provide tuition reimbursement to students attending what we are calling parochial schools, any religious school based solely on the religious status of the school. There again, the problem has been not so much what the constitution provides, what the legislation provides, it has been the practice. And there again, the practice has been simply, hey, if you, are a religious school, we are not gonna provide tuition reimburse, reimbursement to you, no matter what you do with the money, simply based on the religious status of the school. And that runs directly counter to the Espinosa case, okay? So my instinct is to sort of just, is there some way to, on the one hand, comply with the court orders in this case, comply with the requirements of the Espinosa case, that Jim described accurately to you, and at the same time not violate the Vermont constitutional prohibition in the compelled support clause, which is a prohibition against requiring Vermont taxpayers to support with their tax dollars, religious instruction, religious worship, the propagation of religious views with which people may disagree. I think it's quite possible to do so. And in my testimony, I think I can pull it up. I don't know how, whether this is helpful to you or not. I'm gonna try anyway. And we can. Uh, 
I I have now screwed things up here. I've got launch meeting again. I don't know what happened. No, you're you're good. It, it's showing, and we can access it. it. It's it's if you refresh our website, um, you'll see that it's also available on oh, our website. website. Yeah. Oh, refresh your website. Do I go down to join the Zoom meeting again? No, you're 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 doing fine. Um, we can see the document. Okay. That, you're, that you're doing and if if it's too small or too difficult for people to for our, our members to see they can just go to the website um, okay well so, i i can't see it on my screen but maybe i know <laughs> can you tell me a simple button to press <laughs> so i can, can you, I, I tell you what why don't we have jesse do it <laughs> or jesse can you help i certainly can i have it ready right here okay take the screen back and um we'll, we'll put it up jesse can you get my screen back oh there <laughs> we go there we go okay they great okay okay look i am going to try to be helpful but i also am going to complicate your lives I have, yeah no i have i was asked on short notice to testify on this a couple of weeks ago before senate education committee and i did the best i could I came up with what I thought was a pretty sensible Vermont solution, but since then I've done some additional research and it's gotten a little bit more complicated. So let me just tell you, I'm gonna make three passes through fairly briefly. One is, what can we do as a state to comply with the court orders in joining us not to continue to discriminate against religious schools simply or solely based on their religious status and at the same time not violate the Vermont Constitution and the compelled support clause in the Constitution. The next level of complication is that it comes from another decision that the United States Supreme Court handed down just this past year. It's a case called Our Lady of Guadalupe and in that case the court held that religious institutions, including private religious schools, are not bound by federal or state anti-discrimination laws. Laws that prohibit discrimination based on age, on basis of disability, on basis of gender, on basis of uh, uh, sexual preference. Those laws cannot be applied to religious schools because of something called a ministerial exception. Why is that a complication? Because it means that not only if we provide taxpayer support to religious schools, not only would we be violating the compelled support clause, but we also would be providing taxpayer support to institutions that have policies or may have policies that are directly in contradiction to the commitments and values that are reflected in our anti-discrimination laws. So that's the second level. And then finally, my final pass through was a very important case that was decided by the first circuit. That's down in Boston. It, we're in the second circuit, but it is related. It was decided by a panel of three circuit court judges, including interestingly, the retired chief justice of the Supreme Court, David Souter. He joined, he was a member of this panel. So the decision has particular weight. Why is it significant? Because that court held that a main tuition reimbursement program that is very, very similar to Vermont's tuition reimbursement program did not violate the free exercise clause and found a number of reasons for distinguishing the Espinosa case uh, saying that it, it really did not operate there. So th we've got some lessons to learn from all these three cases. I will tell you, if we were sitting here six months ago, none of this stuff would have, ha have been decided. So we're dealing with very recent decisions, both at the federal level and at the state level. So I think I've described, and Jim, I think, does a good job of describing the problem. Now, Jesse is running this show, so I don't know how to move this. There we go. We can just jump all the way, there's the, okay, okay. I've identified sort of the two major dimensions of the problem. Jesse, if you could keep on going down further until we get to sort of the next section. So stop right there. 
So how do we, what, what steps do we need to take to comply with federal court injunction, to bring our policy into line with the Espinoza decision, and at the same time, not violate the compelled support clause of the Vermont Constitution, I think this would do it. It would be just to have school districts adopt this policy, which I set out there. It is the policy of this school district to authorize payment of monthly requests for reimbursement of tuition from all independent schools, regardless of religious status or affiliation. Get that right out there. Upon receipt of certification that none of the tuition for which reimbursement is requested has been or will be used to support religious instruction, worship, or other religious activity, or the propagation of religious views. That brings Vermont, it's really important that school districts who have as a matter of practice been denying reimbursement of tuition to religious schools on the basis of their religious status make clear that they're not gonna be doing it on the basis of re religious status anymore they will authorize payment if though any independent school certifies that none of the tuition they're requesting will be used for religious instruction or worship, okay? So a pretty simple Vermont solution. I think there may be problems with it, but it does the work. Jesse, if you could continue to move down a little bit. <clears throat> It would bring Vermont policy into line with the federal court decisions. All they say is you must stop denying religious, excuse me, you must stop denying tuition support on the basis of religious status, solely on the basis of, it would bring us into line with those decisions. It would bring us into line with the Espinoza case because we'd no longer be denying tuition reimbursement support based solely on religious status. At the same time, we would make sure that the funds that we were providing were not being used for purposes of religious worship or instruction, because if, we, if they were being used that way, it would violate the Vermont Constitution compelled support provision. I don't know where we are on this diagram. I think we, we got to go back up a little bit, Jesse. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Okay, well, right there, yeah, <clears throat> okay. I think the question would be, if we go back up and take a look at that very simple language of the policy right there, whether this certification requirement does the kind of work that needs to be done. Now, the Vermont Supreme Court in the town of Chittenden case, as Jim indicated, said, no problem with providing state aid to religious schools. You just have to ensure that there are safeguards in place to ensure that those funds will not be used for religious instruction and worship. So how do you do that? You simply say, you'll get the tuition re reimbursement money if you certify that that tuition will not be used to support religious instruction or worship. Go, uh, if you could go down a little bit, Jesse. You know, I don't know how the Vermont Supreme Court would respond if it was asked, well, is that an adequate safeguard, the certification requirement? But what I can tell you, keep on going down just a little bit more, Jesse, <clears throat> that this United States Supreme Court in a case called Mitchell versus Helms has given its stamp of approval to this approach. This was a case where state and federal governments were providing educational equipment to private schools, including private religious schools. The only safeguard against abuse was a certification requirement like this one. And the court found that that certification requirement did provide adequate safeguards against possible abuse. So we've got that case out there I'm just sort of in my proposal trying to replicate what the Supreme Court has already given a stamp of approval to in, a, in saying certification requirements like this do provide sufficient safeguards against 
government aid being used for purposes of religious worship or instruction. Jesse, go down just a little bit more. I've got, I quote from uh, <clears throat> Justice O'Connor. There, there it is, okay. This is right there in Justice O'Connor's concurrence. Justice Breyer joined in it. It's, uh, the court said at the state level, uh, the program requires all non-public schools to submit signed assurances. They will use the aid only to supplement, not to supplant federal fund, non-federal funds and that the instructional materials and equipment will only be used for secular, neutral and non-ideological purposes. Now in my proposal, I put it negatively, will not be used for purposes of religious worship or instruction, but you could put it positively too, will only be used for secular, neutral, certify it one way or the other. I don't care, they, they both do the same work as far as I'm concerned. So con continue on just a little bit more down, Jesse, please, okay? I have to say, I have some reservations about the state getting into the business of trying to identify particular items in a school's budget for which might be eligible for reimbursement, other items that wouldn't be eligible for reimbursement. I don't think it's workable. I don't think, I think it'll raise some what they call entanglement problems that we ought to try to stay away from. The nice thing about the certification approach is it's very practical and simple and workable. So that's why I suggest it here. In any event, that's just a, a you know, a kind of Verm simple Vermont practical solution. This will allow us to satisfy both, both the federal constitutional requirements and the state constitutional requirements. I see Representative a question from yeah. Representative Austin. Yes, I'm wondering, um, could the um, agency, you know, mandate that, let's say, science instruction be based on science? So you would have to teach evolution as opposed to creation. Wouldn't that be teaching religion? Well, the court has, in fact, held that teaching, I think, what is it called? Something, uh, creationism. Right is a form of, of impermissible establishment of religion. <laughs> but okay. you just don't want the agency of education getting into sort of, well, this would qualify, but that wouldn't qualify. This is secular. No, that's sectarian. No, that's got a little touch of sectarianism. I just think a simple, straightforward, hey, look, either you certify or you don't. If you certify, you're eligible for the tuition reimbursement payments. If you can't certify, you're not eligible. Is it gonna be challenged? Sure. But there's nothing in the existing case law out there that says the state cannot do that. So. Representative thank Brown. Thank you. Representative Brown, excuse me. Oh, thank you, Chair Webb. Uh, so Professor Teachout, in, in going back to the, the certification solution to the, to the current legal problem, um, so you're suggesting that the state wouldn't really have much, if any, of a role in looking beyond the face of the certificate in terms of, you know, digging into accounting practices or anything like that? I think that's a good question. And my sense is that if the state started getting into that, it would really get into what I call entanglement issues which is to say the state's making decisions about what is religious instruction and what is not religious instruction. I wish there were a neat way to do so, but I just can't see it. That's why I think you've got to go simple with just you certify, we're going to trust you. If it turns out you're using state money on a day-to-day -day basis to teach religion courses, to conduct prayers, or whatever, then we will stop. You will lose your eligibility. That, I, I wish there was another way to do it, but I don't, it, I don't, I think once you move away from a very simple certification requirement, the state's gonna be in trouble. In your research, do you know, are there other states in the country that are using this kind of certification approach in regards specifically to tuition? I don't know that. Uh, I would, I haven't had a chance to look that up, but that would be interesting, okay. Thanks. Representative James. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Teachout. This is so interesting. Um, 
So on the certification process, I guess my question is similar to, to Rep Brown's. If there were a parochial school um, that was accepting voucher money and they conducted Vespers in the afternoon and had a, um, I don't know, like a catechism class um, that was required as part of their curriculum. I, I guess I just don't get how it works. Do, do they have to stop doing that or do they certify? And then if they're ever challenged in court, they provide accounting that says, well, actually we use that voucher money for gym and, and lunch. Oh. You try to imagine yourself representing a parochial school. What do we do in that case? Okay. And I think it would be, I think you'd have to say if religion pervades our educational program, we just can't certify that. We might be able to segregate the religious aspects of our program, put them at a special time of day involving special staff, in which case we would just deduct the amount of money we're spending on that segregated part of the program from the tuition we're requesting. And the tuition we're requesting is just for straight up sort of secular education you get in any public school in the state. You could do that. I think it's possible, but I think for most, in fact, for Rice and probably any other parochial school, any other religious school, it would be very difficult to certify. So you're basically saying if you can't certify, you're not going to be eligible for those tuition funds because we need to be sure that taxpayer money is not being used for purposes of religious instruction or proselytization. I, if, if, if somebody can come up with a better way of doing it, I'm happy to I'm happy to explore the possibilities, but I just don't see any other way to ensure that those taxpayer funds will not be used for the purposes of religious worship and instruction. So the, this, this solution satisfies both the US and Vermont constitution and then really just puts it on the schools to say certify or don't. Yeah, and the only thing I can, I can say Representative James, is that this is an approach that was given a stamp of approval, a simple certification. In that Mitchell versus Helms case, it was also a similar mechanism was used in a case called the Agostini case, which involved, and this is really important, bringing special needs teachers onto the campus of parochial schools, which allows the kids to be mainstream, subject to a certification that those special needs teachers would not engage in any form of religious indoctrination or worship or participate in the sort of the religious aspects of it. it was again approved in that context. So it's got some precedential approval, uh, but whether it would stand challenge in this area, who knows. So this actually gets to one of one of my um, issues, which is, you know, our public schools are required to take all students, regardless of disability. And in addition, our public schools are basically meant to be designed to be very diverse and have students of a uh, broad uh, income uh, background, that that's, that's the American melting pot. And the concern that um, that this taking dollars off of public education and putting them into independent schools is always a concern. Um, I, what I'm wondering is if there's a way to address, and this is for all of our independent schools, not just the, the ones that are religious. I know that our, our um, Act 173 Census-Based Funding Group right now is working on rules for independent schools related to special education. And is there a way, do we, um, if we, can we uh, require <laughs> that public dollars go to schools that um, serve all students of all needs? I th one, I think that's a good question. I have to confess that I was chair of a, of a board of trustees of a little independent school down in this area. <laughs> all the Sharon Academy for about five years. I got the position because before that I was chair of a public school <laughs> board for about five years. But anyway, 
I have great respect for the work that independent schools do. I know they struggle with providing special needs kids with the kind of services, the full range of services they need. I think it's uh, the state clearly has authority to say if you can't provide the level of special education needs that we think you can provide, you are not going to be eligible for any kind of tuition support, any other sort of state aid. So that's my answer. I just think it's good that the state generally has modified in some respects the kind of demands you have for the range and extent of special needs support that some of the independent schools have to provide. But they ought to be providing, doing their share to the extent they've got the resources to do so. Representative Conlon and then Arison. Sort of along those same lines about, um, you know, in this case, uh, Kate is talking about discriminating against special needs kids. You had talked earlier about uh, that um, religious schools can't be compelled to have anti-discrimination policies. But, but can um, the district that is funding the student have a policy that says no tax dollars going to schools that don't have anti-discrimination policies? Excellent question. I address that in the next part of my testimony. Until this year, we did not know as a matter of constitutional law that private religious schools could exempt their employees, their firing and hiring decisions, decisions about controlling employees from the ordinary application of federal and state anti-discrimination laws. But this case that was decided by the Supreme Court last summer called uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe, the court carved out a broad spectrum for private religious schools to claim exemption from the application of anti-discrimination laws that apply to everybody else. Okay. It's called the ministerial exception. I, I think we have to adjust our policy to respond to that decision by, and what I suggest in my testimony, again, it's sort of simple Vermont work, but I suggest, why don't we just add a provision, another certification provision? Now we got two. We certify that we comply fully with state anti-discrimination laws, federal anti-discrimination laws, and that none of the money that we get will be used for purposes of religious worship or instruction. That's my suggestion. I think, Jim may disagree with me, but I think the state has got the authority to require that schools receiving taxpayer money comply with our anti-discrimination laws and policies. Jim, you may disagree with that. Could I respond to that, please? Mm. Yeah. Uh, do you mind if I share my screen for a second again? Say what? Can I share my screen, Jesse, again? Yeah. Yes, Jim, you're all set now. Okay, hold on. I just want to let you know it's happening on the, on the Senate side um, because it is directly relevant to what we're talking about. Um, so I've drafted this bill on the Senate side to incorporate what Professor Teacher recommends. Um, I'll go through it, do it in detail. Uh, but basically, uh, so, so my things about what we've talked about, but the heart of it says that in order to a school district can't pay tuition to independent schools um, uh, unless we receive certification. So it's here. Um, so the certification requirements here, and that goes on to basically give an exception saying that it's okay if you have an overview course in revision. Um, so the certification is here, but what's controversial about this is what's here. Uh, I think, which is C says the school district shall not pay tuition um, to any of the school or programs, regardless of religious status or affiliation, unless the school or program complies with all federal and state anti discrimination laws applicable to public schools. And that there, there is the, the issue that Professor Teachup mentions, which is the ministerial exception for, um, for employment law. So that you can discriminate 
against employees if you're a religious school under that case you mentioned. There is public accommodation law uh, laws in, in Vermont. Uh, so place of public accommodation is not allowed to discriminate, but that requires that um, a condition upon them being open to the general public. I don't know how that applies to private schools um, and whether they can discriminate because they don't invite the general public in. Um, so the number of issues around what, what anti-discrimination laws currently apply to private schools uh, and, uh, and what, what, what could be applied to them. So I just want to mention that on Friday this week, uh, afternoon in the Senate, we've got this language being discussed. We've got uh, lawyers from our office and also um, the Human Rights Commission's coming in, the uh, Attorney General, General Civil Rights Unit's coming in, and the ACLU's coming in to talk about this very topic about what can and can't be done here uh, to apply these uh, anti-discrimination laws to private schools. And lastly, I'll mention that under Act 173, you have already applied the special education laws to independent schools beginning in 2023. So you've already done that. The question now is whether you want, whether you can go further and want to go further in applying all anti-discrimination laws to private schools. And so that's Jim, so yeah. Jim, Jim, I think this guy's absolutely brilliant. Uh, <laughs> as I used to say, he stole all my best thoughts <laughs> and probably did a better job of it <laughs> than I do. Exactly what I'm proposing. Look, the state can't require after this Supreme Court decision, can't require private religious schools to comply with state or federal anti-discrimination laws in hiring and firing decisions in regulating the conduct of its employees. But that is quite different from saying the constitution requires the state to subsidize schools who don't comply with federal and state anti-discrimination laws. It's a very different thing. You can interfere with those decisions, but that doesn't mean state taxpayers have to support schools that are unwilling to comply with our anti-discrimination. Two different issues. That's my reaction. It, it, is it fair to say that if a school certifies as proposed in this bill, they have to live under the constant fear that somebody will challenge that certification in court? In other words, it doesn't necessarily fall to the agency of education to inspect what they're doing, but they could open themselves up to a lawsuit from anybody who has evidence that they're using the money for, you know, for religious purposes. That's true. That's true. Nothing wrong with living in fear. <laughs> no, they would be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my, look, my view is that schools like Rice, Mount St. Joseph's. You got to remember, Pat Leahy went to St. Michael's. He's not. He didn't turn out too badly as a consequence. <laughs> but most of these schools aren't doing too much harm out there. Most of the, I think they're all generally going to operate in good faith, but if they blatantly take the money and then engage in anti-discrimination, excuse me, in discrimin discriminatory practices, I think we, the state would be within its limits then to withhold any further funding. So I think we have time for one more question, uh, Representative Harrison. Unmute. I do it all the time. <laughs> it, 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 not so much a question as a comment. My daughter went to a K-8 Catholic school. We're not Catholic, but I can say unequivocally that the Catholic doctrine permeated every class every day. And I think what we're looking at for a possible bill would be something that a school could not uh, possibly honestly it adhere to. And maybe that's our intent. I agree. Can I respond to that? That might be true, but schools have a number of capital needs, right? Construction needs, maintenance needs, operational needs. 
So I could imagine a school saying, we're going to put this public money into our capital fund uh, to you know, build playgrounds and, and buildings. And so there might be ways in which it's not so hard for these schools to apply. Um, so I'm just throwing that out there that I can see avenues here um, for compliance. And there's uh, a bill that, that's being addressed in the Senate. We also have one on, on our wall. Um, introduced by Representative Burroughs, I believe, that's ad addressing part of this issue. Um, whether we were able to get to it this year or not, um, after seeing how complicated things have gotten on the floor, um, it, it may be something with that uh, we'll be able to, to address next year unless, unless the Senate passes something over this year. If, if I could respond very briefly to mm -hmm. Representative Arishan's comment, I agree completely. It's so interesting, if you read the court's decision in this Our Lady of Guadalupe case, the anti-discrimination, you will find the court going on and on about the extent to which ordinary employees in a private religious school engage on a day-to-day -day basis, not only in providing religious instruction, but in modeling the faith that the schools is the school's mission. So it is pervasive and the court recognizes it. Of course, it recognized that in that case in order to insulate decisions regarding those employees from application of the anti-discrimination laws. But you can flip that on its head and say, if that's true, schools like that ought not to be receiving taxpayer support for their programs, because that is subsidizing discriminatory practices that run counter to some of our deepest commitments and values. Thank you. Um, this is, has been really, really helpful. Uh, I, I appreciate this. I know that we are probably all uh, open to question from our constituents, not so much running in the store as it used to be. Um, but it's very helpful to have this background. It, it's clear that um, as things progress that we are very likely going to need to be addressing this issue. I, if, if I could say in conclusion, I think it's important that the committee keep in mind, we've been talking about parochial schools. That's been our experience in Vermont. But if you look nationally, you will find that there are lots of different types of religious schools. There are Islamic schools. There are Jewish religious schools. There are evangelical Christian schools. Most of them really have and pursue values that we all share. But there certainly are aspects of every religious belief that may run counter to the values that we share and as part of our constitutional tradition. And so we just need to be we're dealing with parochial schools in this context, but whatever policy the state adopts and implements needs to respond to the reality that we may see in Vermont sooner or later, other types of religious schools that I've mentioned. This has been most helpful. Um, My pleasure. I think I to speak for the committee that we really appreciated this conversation. Thank you, Jim, for your work on this uh, and for to Professor Teachouts for taking What's next lecture? week's topic with our lawyers? <laughs> <laughs> Can we have this lecture every week? <laughs> Thanks okay. a lot. And, and just let me know if I can be helpful. I'm sorry if I went on a little bit too long, but, but let me know if I can be helpful. Thank you. No, it, it, it's very interesting. We appreciated it. So uh, we are going to break. Uh, so.